Hello! Welcome to Sensation Psychophysics. Psychophysics has an interesting history that goes back to the start of modern psychology. As you might recall from an earlier video, modern psychology is typically said to have started in 1879 in the Laboratory of Psychological Research at Leipzig in Germany, and its founder was Wilhelm Wundt, who was born in 1832. It's interesting to think about some of these years, like 1879 and 1832, as we develop our own narratives about the colleges that we attend and the lifespans of our relatives that we know and so forth. It's important to think about some historical dates. For example, in 1831, Charles Darwin sailed to the Galapagos Islands on the HMS Beagle, and Wundt was born the following year. You might think about when your college was established. Denison University happens to have been established in December of 1831. So these historical references allow us to put the development of these ideas into perspective. Psychophysics, which started back in that time, can be defined this way. The science of establishing quantitative relationships between physical stimulation and psychological events. Let's take a look at some of the early founders of psychophysics, and they include Ernst Weber, an early psychophysicist, and a contemporary of his, Gustav Fechner. And we'll see later on that there are some important principles in psychophysics that are known as the Weber Law, or perhaps the Weber-Fechner Law. Interestingly, these two founders had many intellectual offspring, and those folks went on to have other intellectual offspring, and so on down the line. And eventually, I came along. So here is yours truly. I am a psychophysicist, and some of my intellectual ancestors include Weber and Fechner. If you're interested in learning about the family tree that you're hearing about in this video, you might click on this line down here and see that I will have an advisor who has an advisor who has an advisor that goes back to Fechner and to Weber. An interesting historical note. We can think of psychophysics as being very strongly related to mathematical functions, and some of these you'll recall even from junior high school or high school. A mathematical function is a rule for turning one number into another number. And as you recall from junior high school or high school, a very famous mathematical function is a simple linear function. y is equal to mx plus b. And we remember that m corresponds to the slope. It gets multiplied by our x value. We add some kind of a constant that we call our y-intercept, and that allows us to estimate some kind of y value. This is a simple linear function, y equals mx plus b. A psychophysical function is very much like a mathematical function. A psychophysical function is a rule for turning one number into another number, just like a mathematical function. But we can be a little bit more precise now. The psychophysical function is a rule for turning one number that happens to be a quantified stimulus into another number that happens to be a quantified psychological response. We are, after all, psychologists here using psychophysics. Let's take an example. We might say that somebody's psychological response would be, as an example, three times the physical stimulation plus some kind of constant or y-intercept, two. Psychophysical functions can be graphed, just like any other kind of function, including the simple linear functions. So let's take a look at some graphing. Here, we have some kind of psychological response as our dependent variable, typically plotted on the y-axis. And what we're going to be manipulating in a psychophysics experiment will be some kind of physical stimulation. An example that we'll develop on a regular basis here might be the amount of salt that we put into a drink of water, and we're measuring basically somebody's sensitivity to saltiness. The level of salt can be experimentally manipulated here on our physics axis, and we can plot different psychological responses to that kind of physical change. We can benefit by having some words that will allow us to describe really any kind of graph that we might encounter in any kind of science, including psychological science and one of its subfields, psychophysics. So our text for describing graphs might be something like this. In this graph, psychological experience, that's the psycho, is plotted as a function of physical stimulation. And that's a general pattern that we can use for describing any kind of psychophysical graph. In this graph, psychological experience, psycho, is plotted as a function of physical stimulation. I always like to do this with my students. I like to have them point up and down along the vertical axis and say psycho, and then across the x-axis as they're pointing left to right, physics, psycho, physics. Say it with me, psycho, physics. There we are. Here's a simple example. 
Sometimes, psychologists are interested in how people perceive physically the world around them. This is perceived length on the y-axis, and this is the physical length of the stimulus. So it might turn out that we get lucky and we can use something like a y equals mx plus b equation to describe the relationship between the psychological variable, how the person is perceiving length, or how the animal might not be a human, but some non-human animal is perceiving length, and the physical length that's actually put before them. So we can go back to our text and we can say something like this. In this graph, perceived length is plotted as a function of physical length, and we see a relatively nice linear relationship that might be well described by our old friend y equals mx plus b. And it turns out that some psychophysical relationships, that is some psychological experiences, do correspond linearly to the change in physical stimulation on the x-axis. It's not always that simple, though. We have many exceptions to that general rule. One case might be what happens when we're responding to electric shock. Here, as the electric shock is going up in equal step sizes along the physics axis, that's our x-axis here, we might see that we get actually larger and larger and larger changes in our sensation. That is, the sensation is getting much more intense proportionally than you might have guessed from a simple straight line model of y equals mx plus b. In fact, this is a crude diagram of your response and my response to electric shock, a relatively small step size generates a relatively large response. We call this kind of departure from a linear trend a nonlinearity, and more specifically, we call this electric shock response an expansive nonlinearity, because the line is growing at a rate faster than would have been predicted by a simple linear trend. And we do see the simple linear trend occurring typically for visual size, but not for electric shock. Those are different kinds of psychological experiences. Electric shock is modeled well by an expansive nonlinearity. There are other kinds of examples that move in the opposite direction. For example, our response to lights or to sounds tends to be compressive rather than expansive. And what we mean by that is for equal step sizes along the x-axis, yes, we continue to get larger and larger sensations, but the sensations reach a point of diminishing returns. Some students might recognize this as an asymptote. That is, yes, we get increases. However, the increases get smaller and smaller sensation-wise for a given step size on the physical axis. And this is what we typically see in many animals, humans and other mammals. We typically have a compressive nonlinear response to lights or to sounds. We can have other kinds of shapes in our psychophysical functions also. A very commonly observed one is exemplified when we ask people to subjectively rate their favorability of different soft drinks or maybe different kinds of snacks. And we're systematically manipulating now the level of sugar in the snack or in the soft drink. What we frequently observe is something that you might recognize as a so-called quadratic trend. This is a U-shaped trend. In this case, it's an inverted U. And there's some relatively central level of sugar that people respond to very, very favorably. If we add just a little bit too much or we take away some, we'll find that the favorability ratings fall off relatively reliably. So this is actually a very orderly kind of trend, even though it's drawn crudely here. It's a relatively orderly kind of trend, and it happens not to be linear. It's actually highly nonlinear, but it is still orderly. And we would still use our text for this kind of a graph and say something like, in this graph, favorability rating, that's our psychological variable, is plotted as a function of sugar concentration. That's what we're physically manipulating in this graph. Okay, some other ideas come up when we're talking about psychophysics, and one is the important notion of threshold and the related idea of sensitivity. We can think of sensitivity as responsiveness to stimulation. And we can further develop that by saying that a system, like maybe your visual system or your auditory system, or maybe the organism as a whole, if it has low sensitivity, it will exhibit little or no response to stimulation. So if we were to plot a sensitivity by stimulation graph, we'd have a relatively shallow slope here when we have low sensitivity. By contrast, a system or an organism with high sensitivity will exhibit a strong response to stimulation. This will give us a relatively steep slope on that same kind of sensitivity by stimulation plot. We can contrast sensitivity with threshold. And we can define threshold as the smallest stimulus quantity required for a desired response level. Let's see if we can unpack that just a little bit. The 75% correct threshold is the stimulus strength to which a participant responds correctly on three quarters of trials.
Okay, so now we have a particular case where we might be measuring a response that is either demonstrably correct or incorrect. And it might be the case that we have what we would call a two alternative forced choice experiment. You might have to say, for example, that the salt was present in the water or that the salt was absent in the water. And there are correct or incorrect answers on that kind of a trial. And we could figure out what level of salt we would need for you to respond with 75% accuracy. We would call that your 75% correct threshold. Now here's a mantra that might help you. I found through the years that a lot of students benefit by saying that sensitivity and thresholds are inversely related. Can you say that with me? Sensitivity and thresholds are inversely related. And what we mean by that is high thresholds correspond to low sensitivity and vice versa. So going back to our earlier example, it might be the case that you only need something like one milligram of salt in order to be correct 75% of the time. I might need something like two milligrams of salt in order to be correct 75% of the time. My threshold would be larger than yours. I need a larger stimulus quantity than you because I'm comparatively less sensitive to salt than you would be. Okay, let's see if we can now just understand a little bit about the terminology that comes to us. And again, interestingly, this originates from the laboratories in Germany in the late 1800s. The German word Lyman refers to threshold. So this is an interesting historical or etymological note. Etymology refers to the origin of words. The word subliminal refers to stimulation that is just beneath detectability. In everyday life, maybe you and your friends have talked about a subliminal message, that is, a message that is somehow beneath our detectability. This is the origin of the commonly used word subliminal in subliminal messages. You can see that it goes back to the German word of Lyman, subliminal, subliminal. So that word, interestingly, has its roots in psychophysics. Let's now consider two frequently used types of thresholds, and we'll contrast them with each other. One is called the absolute detection threshold. This is the smallest stimulus quantity that a system or an organism can reliably report relative to no stimulation at all. Typically, the experimenter asks the participant whether a given stimulus is present or not, and this is sometimes called a yes-no experiment. We've already seen one example. It might be the case that we have many, many trials where you and I are sipping water, and on half of those trials, the water contains absolutely no salt. On the other half of the trials, randomly interleaved, there's maybe one milligram of salt. And we have to say yes or no whether something is present. And we could find the level of salt that we would need to be correct 75% of the time. And this would be an absolute detection threshold. We're detecting the presence versus the absence of a stimulus. This is an important psychophysical quantity, the absolute detection threshold. We can contrast that with a near cousin, if you will. We'll call this a difference threshold. This is the smallest discrepancy between two stimulus quantities that a system or an organism can reliably report. This is often called the just noticeable difference or the JND. Let's say that together. The just noticeable difference is the JND. There we go. Typically, the experimenter now asks the participant to report whether two stimuli are the same or different. So now it might be the case that we always give you water that contains some salt but on half the trials, we're giving you one drink of water that contains one milligram and another drink of water that contains one milligram. That's what happens on half the trials. Those are same trials. On other trials, one of your drinks will have one milligram of salt. The other one will have two. Those are physically different. The question becomes, can the participant make that distinction? Are their sensory systems sufficient to describe and detect that kind of a difference? We would call this a difference threshold or a JND, a just noticeable difference. Okay, so when we're talking about just noticeable differences or JNDs, we can go back to one of our early founders, and this was Weber. And Weber created a law to establish a quantitative relation between, again, the psychological experience on our y-axis, as I'm drawing here, and the physical stimulation on our x-axis, as I'm drawing here. And Weber's law states the following, that the just noticeable difference is proportional to stimulus magnitude. We can think of Weber's law, then, as being multiplicative. Here are some examples. Perhaps we can reliably distinguish something like a 5% change in the size or spatial distance we can think of a 10% change in stimulus speed or a 15% change in stimulus duration. These are all percentages which are, in a way, multiplying factors. 
Notice that it's not an absolute value. It's not that we can always detect, for example, a 5 mile per hour or 5 kilometer per hour change in speed. It would depend on the baseline speed. So we would need a larger stimulus change if we have a faster moving stimulus. This is the idea of proportionality or multiplication. And this goes back to Weber. You might remember that a contemporary of Weber was Fechner, and Fechner basically adopted Weber's law, but Fechner said, well, maybe it's not so much a multiplication that it's describing that relationship, rather it's some kind of a logarithm that's describing that relationship. So Fechner would do something like take the logarithm of the change in the stimulus, and that might be a way of describing the relationship between the psycho and the physics. Okay, more contemporarily, We've added to the Weber and Fechner laws by invoking something called signal detection theory. And this is actually a procedure for measuring our sensitivity when we're interested in the sensations that we have in everyday life. We can think of signal detection theory as a procedure for determining the sensitivity of a system or of an organism independent of that system's response bias. And this is a very interesting idea because sometimes we might be getting a lot of positive responses from a system because that system is very sensitive. Alternatively, it might just be the case that that system happens, happens to have a bias. And we can think of response bias in the following way. The inclination to favor one behavioral option over another. So let's take an example that we're already familiar with. It might be that you are actually more sensitive than I am to salt. Okay? You would have greater sensitivity, and that would be of interest to sensory psychologists. It also might be that you just report that you're experiencing salt more than I report that I'm experiencing salt, even though you and I have the same sensitivity. Maybe you're just biased to say, yes, I detect the salt. And signal detection theory allows us to tease out the genuine sensitivity of a system from response biases. To do that, it relies on a simple 2x2 two two matrix that we'll go through here, and this will be our final slide. Here we're plotting a simple 2x2, two two, and we have on the y-axis whether the stimulus is present or not, yes or no. And we can then cross that with the participant's response, again, yes or no. The participant could respond that yes, the stimulus was present, or no, it was not present. So let's see how this 2x2 two two cross works out. And as a little memory trick, you might think of the famous song, New York, New York. We have no yes, no yes, with the stimulus on this side and the response on this side. So let's take the happy cases first, when in fact the participant is correct. On half of the trials, randomly, we might present the stimulus, that is to say that maybe the water contains just a little bit of salt, and the question to the participant is, whether the salt is present or not, and the participant responds on this trial by saying, yes, the salt is there. We would call that a hit. That's a type of correct response. Alternatively, the participant could be correct in a different way. Maybe the salt is not present, so the stimulus is negative here, and we, in fact, have a participant responding, no, the salt was not there. This would be a correct rejection. This is the participant saying no, when, in fact, the stimulus was not present. These are two different kinds of correct responses. We can contrast those with two different kinds of errors that the participant might make. For example, maybe the participant says, yes, the salt was present, when in fact the salt was not present. We would call this a false alarm. It's also known as a false positive or a type 1 error. It's one type of error. There's another type of error called a type 2 error or a false negative, and this occurs when in fact the stimulus was present. In our example, the salt was actually there but the participant failed to detect that. In fact, they missed it. They reported that no, the salt was not there. So summing up, we have a simple 2x2 two two matrix that follows this New York, New York pattern, if you will, and that's our mnemonic for no yes, no yes, and it allows us to classify different kinds of errors that might be made in a psychophysical experiment. Some people might be more inclined to make false alarm errors or type 1 errors. Others might be more inclined to make false negative errors or type 2 errors. Okay. Thanks for listening.